Hi, friends. Thanks for joining us today. Today, my guest is a very old friend. I've known her for many decades, and this is my friend Sherry Kagi. She's a Christian recording artist. She's won uh, many, or she's won a Dove Award. She's had many nominations. She's had multiple number one hits. I'm sure you're very familiar with her, and um, she has come on because she's she's gone through some losses herself, and I know she has a lot of spiritual and tangible advice to offer everyone. So welcome, Sherry. <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me, Debbie. Bless you. Um, okay, I'm, there we go. I had, there was a little panel that came up on the camera that I had to get rid of. So now I can see you and hear you great. Okay, awesome. <laughs> so glad that you could be with us. So I'm just going to let you start, Sherry, and just share um, what you feel led to share about your story, okay? Yes. Um, well, thank you, first off, for inviting me to chat with you. And um, I um, am grateful for the friendship that, we, that we've that we had. Uh, having. I think I remember meeting you when I was just possibly literally a teenager yes. out in Southern California, right? Yeah, and, I think you were um, 14. <laughs> <laughs> really young. Yeah. And um, so I'm just grateful for your friendship and your wisdom and um how sweet it is to you know though we live i live in tennessee and you still in california um how we can be united in purpose uh through christ and no matter how many miles are between us or how much time passes before we communicate we um, can pick up right where we left off and um, get about the lord's business so thank you um yeah my story um as you're um, looking to minister to people over the Christmas holidays and such, uh, I think, would you say it's true that a broad stroke theme is those dealing with uh, grief and illness and loss and that sort of thing? Those yeah. are some of the topics that you're covering. And um, I'm grateful that our Lord is no um, stranger to grief. Uh, and we uh, walk through seasons of loss on, on this earth as well. And for me, um, it was, it's been three years ago now. Yeah. Um, I lost my dad real unexpectedly. And um, what was unique about it is that also he, uh, we lost him to suicide. And this was um, not something that any of us ever could have expected. And, um, and yet God has, you know, he just comes near to the broken heart. And it's just the way that he works when we lay our hearts bare, split open before him, you know. <laughs> and so God has been with us. Um, I uh, really have had a a long grief journey as many of your viewers have experienced various losses um and yet in that in in the depth of sorrow uh it's almost like god meets us with whatever is the depth of our need he meets us with the fullness of who he is you know and so i have a lot of little things little verses and books and things that God used in my own healing journey that we could delve into uh, to get to some of the practical sides of, um, you know, what do you do when something significant like that has happened? And um, so, yeah, I, I mean, um, trying to think of what, what is most helpful to you. I mean, to how far to go into into the story or how much detail you're looking for, that kind of thing. You know? Well, I just want you to share what you feel comfortable with and if there's books that you want to recommend or what things you found especially helpful. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure anybody would, would appreciate that. I, I know I do have some um, followers who have also lost family members to suicide and, and that's its own unique kind of grief. And um, so I don't know if you want to talk about that if in any of your counseling things or whatever, if they uh -huh. asked that and gave you any helpful information about that. Right. Um, <clears throat> I will say that when I got um, the call from my sister uh, in California at the time um, that dad had taken his life, 
uh, I was, you know, on a plane as soon as I could be to get there and be with mom and such. But that night when it was still just processing the shock of this news, the verse that the Lord kept um, bringing to me was Psalm 116 verse 15. Uh, I, it's not like I was even able to, you know, open my Bible for comfort. It was just like, you're just reeling and, and yet a, a lifetime, a pattern, a habit of being in God's word. If it, if you digest it, uh, the Holy spirit will bring it to the forefront when you need it. And so Psalm 16, 15 comforted me so much. It says precious in the sight of the Lord are the deaths of his saints. Mm -hmm. And so I kept kind of just speaking that and asking the Lord to take care of my daddy, you know, <laughs> and I could look at uh, what I wrote in my journal that night, you know, Lord, please take care of my daddy tonight, you know, and then just reciting that verse, precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. I later, later then processed that through songwriting. And so I included that verse in a song that I wrote and sang at his memorial service in Southern California. And um, it was an interesting thought to think about is how, how it would be possible that, that somehow um, us losing dad would somehow bring a blessing to the Lord uh, or, you know, that it would somehow bring joy to the Lord that he was now embracing his good son in, in eternity, in heaven, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's the sort of a dichotomy. And, but weirdly that sort of comforted me. It's like, okay, okay, dad made this choice. Uh, but now Lord, you can, you can see it from here, you know? <laughs> and, um, and I know because my dad was a believer um, that I have the hope and promise that I'll see him again, um, you know, in heaven. And, and the more people we lose, um, the greater comfort that is. Um, and so I'm trying to think, uh, the, here's one, let me see if I can find this one little thing. I have some notes and things, um, because you said that many, uh, you know, many of your viewers have um, dealt with grief and um, loss via suicide. Okay, this one. So I read, I read a book after dad passed, lots of books. I was grateful for the time to process um, through reading and sitting with the Lord um, and journaling. And in this one book called Aftershock, um, Help, Hope and Healing in the Wake of Suicide by David Cox and Candy Arrington. They said, every suicide survivor is looking for a way to feel normal again, following a life event that is so abnormal. Mm. And, and so the, the faith, the, the Christian in me, I found myself frustrated in some ways with myself because of how long I perceived my grief journey to be. And it's not really been that long. It's been say three years, right? Um, but, you know, soon after dad passed, I found the, the local grief share meeting, you know, and uh, many churches host and facilitate grief share, which I had gone through divorce care several mm -hmm. year, years back and have found it to be helpful. And so I thought, oh, I'm going to look at that. And so it was helpful to sit in those spaces with people, other people who totally got it, you know, and yet even as I said in those meetings, I was like looking for a quick fix, you know, I'm in this fog of grief, I'm stuck, and why isn't my faith working like I think it should, um, you know, because I believe that God is our healer, um, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals, and so I was frustrated that there wasn't a, a little verse, a scripture verse or something that I could just claim and proclaim and then just get myself unstuck. And so in that limbo place, what I came to, the conclusion I came to was that I would just have to trust that God's grace would be sufficient for me right exactly where I was. And uh, that it was okay that I didn't have the quick fix answer, you know, <laughs> or the quick fix remedy to my grief. And 
uh, I think there was that part of me that felt like, is this a lack of faith that I'm struggling so much with the loss of my dad? Uh, but bringing those questions to the Lord, sitting with him, letting him uh, comfort me, letting him uh, be a witness to my tears and letting others be a witness to my tears, mm -hmm. you know, whether it be family or whether it be someone in a grief share group or that sort of thing. And then I did go on to about a year in or so. I did decide, you know, I think I want some one-on-one -on -one counseling, mm -hmm. you know, it's one thing that we have the wonderful counselor as believers and he speaks to us, he ministers to us. Um, but there are people with skin on, you know, that he has equipped, uh, to, to help us when we need that extra help. And, um, interestingly, I had posted a book that was helpful, uh, the grief recovery mm -hmm. handbook. And you'd commented on Facebook, I think that that is a book you're very familiar with and certified in. Yes. Um, so, uh, so that was another layer of healing um, that God brought as I met with a Christian grief counselor. We went through that handbook and uh, she led me to write a, create a relationship graph about my dad because when there's a suicide, you mentioned what's unique, it's a unique kind of loss. Um, there, even if the relationship is good and healthy, and I would say that I had a really good relationship with my dad. He was super supportive of me for many years. Uh, he I always knew that he loved me. He verbalized it and he showed me by actions. He wasn't a perfect father. He had his own childhood baggage and that, you know, that he carried with him throughout his life. And though he was a believer, he still struggled with anger and, you know, all manner of woundedness you know that affected his relationships but he and i were close we could talk about the lord we could share honestly with one another um uh but when there is a loss like that that is sudden and unexpected there is it stands to reason that there would be a part of that, that really that's a relationship that's emotionally incomplete mm -hmm. um because there were things left unsaid yeah. You know, I didn't know this, that he was going to make that choice. And um, for him, I mean, he was very physical and healthy and active all his life and um, an avid backpacker and mountain climber and world traveler. He had so many interesting interests. And, um, and in the end, he had, he was facing some health uncertainties that we think that that may have contributed to his choice, maybe despairing of that. But from the grief recovery handbook, I was able to do a little relationship graph, um, citing both the positives of our relationships and the negatives, you know, um, the hurts and the happies, if you will. And then ultimately write a letter based on some of those memories and some of the things that I realized I wanted to say, write a letter and then read it uh, obviously I couldn't read it to him, but read it to my counselor as she held that space for me, um, read it out loud. And there was something that was really powerful about that, that I wasn't expecting, you know, um, it sounds like a really simple thing, um, or maybe even sort of a cheesy thing or something, but it was weighty and intimate and tender. And it really, it really, really helped me. So uh, I was grateful that helped me sort of climb out of a, a fog of grief, I would describe it as, um, you know, when you feel stuck, um, God is one who can unstick you. <laughs> <I could put. laughs> yes. yes, he can. <laughs> he, he sort of unstuck me a little bit. And uh, there were many, many um, verses and things uh, that you know, that he used to um, encourage me in the process. One I can share, um, let me see if I can find that. Uh, where would I find that? I'll have to get, I'll have to, oh, I think it was in this journal, hang on. I have various things <laughs> stacked up around me. Um, <laughs> For your patience as I try to find this thing. No worry. Okay, yes. Um, 
Okay, so I want to say this was on, say, um, my husband and I. So I got married in 2016. And um, so the Lord brought me a second husband. <laughs> and, um, and I'm grateful for that. He was super patient and supportive and understanding in my uh, grief journey. And, um, but I want to say it was our three-year anniversary, but it was maybe just the two-year anniversary of dad's death. Um, we got to do a little stay at a cabin in like Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, oh. you know, over Christmas. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I had brought all my stuff to have my times with the Lord. And there was a verse that just um, really blessed me from Jeremiah 31, three. Um, and it was another little piece in my healing. It said that verse says, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, have I drawn thee, or another translation says, have I preserved thee? Um, and then going on from there, um, in verse four, it says, um, <clears throat> again, I will build thee, and thou shalt be built, O virgin of Israel. Thou shalt again be adorned with thy tablets and shalt go forth in the dances of them that make merry. Uh, or another translation says, um, again, you will take up tambourines and go out with joyful dancing or go out with joy. So all of that to say, um, I had to hold to that. That was a real promise to me because in, in, my, in my grief and loss of di my divorce back in 2010, a verse that comforted me was um, how he turned our mourning into dancing. Mm -hmm. um, and yet I felt like now I was back in a place of mourning, losing dad. And, um, and so while I couldn't just make myself be joyful or you know snap out of the grief, I could cling to this promise that God would do that work in me at some point. And I just needed to, you know, continue to cling to him, continue to hope in him. Um, and another fun thing that was a discovery, um, I was speaking at, um, and Debbie, I'm talking long-winded, so if you need to interject, feel free. Okay. <laughs> no, I was... I was asked to share and speak and sing at um, a conference and their theme verse was in the book of Psalms. I want to say Psalm 16 or something. And I read, read the whole Psalm in preparation, thinking about what I might share and what songs I might sing. There was a point at which it said, um, uh, it said, I will not abandon you from the grave mm. in, in that verse. And, and I, as I read the whole Psalm, when I came to that verse, I, broke down in tears and that was the first I'd realized okay is dad is dad's suicide sort of like an abandonment wound I hadn't framed it that way mm -hmm. until I read that verse and yet God was saying I will not abandon you from the grave and it was another um and I later wrote a song called abandonment wound which will be on my next project um about that but in that same little um, quiet time with the Lord, something prompted me to go and get, I'm going to show you, this is like an old book. Oh yeah, I remember that. You remember this book? Yes, I had one for my son. <laughs> okay. Well, it's like uh, children's stories of the Bible from the Old and New Testaments. And weirdly, you know, in this time of, of um, meeting with that grief counselor and everything, along with what she was leading me through that handbook. I was very prayerful and I was asking the Lord to show me everything he needed to show me and um, just wanting to cooperate with the Holy Spirit aside from the, the weekly sessions or the little homework assignments, you know, wanting him to show me uh, anyway. So I was prompted to go over to this shelf and pick up this book, which I haven't looked at in years. And I open to the to the front and there's a little inscription and it was from my grandpa Andy who is my my father's father. Wow. 
and Grandpa Andy used to come and stay with us in California when my sister and I were little at Christmas time. He'd stay and we'd sneak into the living room and get our Christmas stockings while he was sleeping on the couch, you know. And um, so I had a, a, a good memories wrapped around my Grandpa Andy, though I couldn't say with certainty, was he a believer? I didn't know, was he a believer? And, and as a child, um, you know, I didn't think to ask him anyway. <laughs> but the inscription says to Sherry, Mary Xmas, Grandpa Andy, and the date, uh, December 25th, 1974. So I was a little girl, uh, so I was maybe six or seven, when he had, for whatever reason, inscribed this book to me. But see, my dad, used to read us stories from this book mm. so here i read that verse the lord um, will not abandon me from the grave and then i've i opened this bible and i see that inscription and i see that when i was a little girl when i was a little girl for some reason my grandpa andy though i don't know if he is a believer or not for some reason he was prompted to inscribed this book to me and then my dad read stories from this book to me so you could say an earthly grandfather and an imperfect earthly father um they were god, god knew that i would i would lose my father in the way that i did mm -hmm. and yet god was wooing me even as a little girl um to his truths and these stories and gospel hope and so that was um a, a long story to to come around to saying uh god god just just showed me his love and care for me that uh dad's choice was no surprise to god though it was a surprise to us um but that that i am my heavenly father's daughter you know god may, gave me an earthly dad uh, but God is my earthly father and he knew me before I was born and he continues to care for me and providentially he placed these men in my life um, to, to guide me in the, in the, in the way that they knew how to, you know, how, so I just cherish, <laughs> I just cherish this book in a, in a strange way and God really ministered to me through that. That's awesome. Would you say, <laughs> Sherry, I know you've, you've walked with the Lord a very long time, but would you say you've come to know the Lord in a, in a different way through this experience? For sure. Uh, for sure. In fact, um, there's, a, there's a strange verse in Ecclesiastes that speaks to this. Um, Ecclesiastes 7 verse 4 says, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. Hmm. Isn't that interesting to ponder? The heart of the wise in the, is in the house of mourning. When we're in the house of mourning, it's not very fun. We don't like it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we don't feel like ourselves. You know, I told my husband at some point when I was in that grief fog, I said, I feel like normally I function. Um, I'm a multitasker. A lot of us women are. I, I function as three people normally. I thrive on product productivity and all of this. But in that season, I felt like I was functioning as half of one person, you know, right. just half of myself and just not having the gumption um, that I normally have in life. Um, <clears throat> but so all of that to answer your question, I think it has given me more empathy for people who say are not able to just pull themselves up from their bootstraps and just turn a new leaf, turn a new page when there's been a trauma or a tragedy or a loss. And you think, well, hasn't it been, haven't you been grieving long enough? I mean, can't you just move on? And shouldn't you be over this by now? I think I have more empathy for those who can't just, you know, snap out of it. Mm -hmm. Because I was there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was there. Um, and yet I'm grateful that I had a season, you know, not traveling much. Well, I did do some travel in that time, but a season where I could really be home and sit with the Lord at length and really look at the stuff. Interestingly, from that book, 
in fact, I, I have it here. Uh, that book we talked about, the mm -hmm. Grief Recovery Handbook. Um, I was looking back at some of my notes in preparation for this interview, and it um, and I found about the book. It talks about STERBS, S T E R B S. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Yes. Which, yeah. So you can teach on that, but it's a uh, short-term energy relieving behaviors. Um, and one of the takeaways from the book was. Um, keeping busy buries the pain of loss under an avalanche of activity. And um, one of the things I kind of realized through that process is um, STURBs are things that we might do to distract us from feeling the weight of our pain, you know, or the weight of our loss or really sitting and allow ourselves a good cry. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we get busy oh, because we don't want to go there. It's too painful. And I felt like the Lord was showing me that strangely through the years, in my painful times, I would go to like some would, you know, we'll go to, well, don't we sometimes go to food or TV or entertainment or shopping or for some drugs and alcohol or, you know, these things to sort of not deal with reality. And I really realized one of my coping mechanisms through the different pains and losses in my life has been songwriting. Mm. And you would say, well, that's a healthy coping mechanism. And yes, I, the Lord allowed me to process a lot of my pain and loss through songwriting. And on this next album, um, which will release in 2022, uh, you'll hear some of that uh, processing grief in my songs, but the Lord showed me, um, maybe, maybe now through this counseling season, he was giving me an opportunity to sit a little more with those griefs, um, instead of just running to the piano and sort of taking the edge off the pain for the moment, you know, and then moving on and now, you know, recording the song, promoting the song, talking about the song, whatever. Um, so that's, isn't that an interesting takeaway? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, um, I, I feel like I should interject two things here. Yes. One is um, if people don't deal with their grief, like you mentioned, uh, some people think, well, shouldn't you have moved on and, and it, haven't you grieved long enough? But what a lot of people don't realize, if we don't deal with our grief and we, we do bury it or we just get busy and try to forget about it and distract ourselves from it, the more losses we have that we don't process, they just pile up on top of each other. And for it, and it may just take one little thing and someone goes, well, why did that send that person off the deep end? But they didn't realize they had all this unresolved grief that they had yeah. through before then. So that's one thing I'd like people to keep in mind. We, we just don't know what someone has dealt with. And, and I've mentioned in other ones that uh, other interviews, we don't all grieve the same. And you and your dad were very close, but somebody else might lose their father and they weren't close at all. And it's not going to impact them the same. So we can't, we, we have to be careful not to judge other people or, or go by our experience and say, well, this is how I did it. Why aren't you doing it that way? You know, that sort of yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, the other thing is, um, and I just left. <laughs> I keep having these senior moments. I hate this. Um, I'm right there with you, girl. <laughs> I go on these bunny trails and I get lost out <laughs> in the woods, you know. <laughs> oh, it'll come to me in a minute. But um, yeah. I do have a question for you, though. Um, a lot of people that have lost someone to suicide, they deal with guilt. Did you have any of that? Um, mercifully, mercifully, no. Um, interestingly, I think, you know, obviously God knew and he gave us a gift just probably weeks before this decision that he made. I was on the phone with dad and he was updating me about some of his medical stuff. And, um, and in that conversation, for whatever reason, I had the wherewithal to say, dad, we don't know how, how much longer you have on this earth. Um, uh, but we're, but it's okay because while you've traveled the world and you've seen, you've been in almost every country and we have, um, the photographs to show and the, the slideshow to show, um, you're the greatest trip ever is your, 
is destination home, our eternal home with Christ. And so I said, you have that assurance. And so it's okay, whatever happens, you know, whether you have this transplant or not, you know, however many days you have, it's okay, because we're eternal in Christ. And it went from a conversation between a mother, I mean, a father and a daughter, um, to a conversation between a brother and sister in Christ. And so I, I look back on that. And I'm, I'm grateful for that conversation. Also, just um, my birthday, uh, I turned 50 August 29th uh, that year, 2018. And um, some friends and my husband, they, uh, they threw a surprise party for me. And a friend of mine suggested randomly, hey, let's FaceTime your parents in California, you know? And um, I had my grandson, my new grandson on my hip, which my dad was looking forward to meet and hold. I mean, we had plans to visit out over Thanksgiving and stuff, and he was going to get to meet his grandson for the first time. Um, but anyway, we FaceTimed and chatted briefly with mom, and then then the then the camera went on dad. And so I have this image now of dad with his huge grin, toothy grin, looking because he was delighting in his grandson that I had on my hip, you know. And so it was like a this. I forget how many months old he was. Um, this this baby on my arm connect locking eyes with his grandpa, you know, <laughs> and a oh, great grandpa, I should say. And that moment is frozen in time for me. Um, I think that may be the last time I actually saw Dad was on that FaceTime call, and he he was just beaming. So, um, so I didn't I didn't have feelings of guilt because like I said we had had a good relationship I did have to work through moments of anger um, a little bit of anger at dad mm -hmm. I didn't live there but I couldn't help but you know scribble in my journal you know realizing the weight of what he had done the power of a moment you know mm -hmm. uh, there's a there's a lyric of song on this new album and the title of the song is Destination Home. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the opening line is, you didn't have to do that to go and take your life. I shouldn't have ever had to take that phone call in the night. Um, I know that things got scary. It's hard to lose control, but that's the time to take, to let go and take hold. We're just passing through. This is the chorus. We're just passing through in a, uh, we're just passing through, uh, uh, in a foreign land and our hearts were made for somewhere down the road. So stand fast and strong and keep traveling on till we're on our way to destination home. And the second verse is you left a note for mother, but there was none for me. If I didn't know how much you cared, guess I'd still be angry. Wow. The power of a moment. You just can't take it back. Lord, have mercy for the things we lack. And then we're just passing through in a foreign land and a heart. So it's a very somber song, probably one of the more melancholy songs on the album. But, um, but so I had that moment of anger because it was realizing wow, dad, he didn't, he didn't leave a note for me or my sister. He didn't really leave a note, note for mom, but, but he did leave in it written in his own hand, some lyrics to an old Elvis Presley song that was special to them. Mm -hmm. um, I can't help falling in love with you. So that was sitting very intentionally on a TV tray um, for mom to discover. So it was, a, it was a, you know, a, a, a gesture of love towards mom mm -hmm. and though I knew and have always known and will never question whether dad loved me that was so apparent throughout my life um there was that moment where gosh you didn't you know I don't have I don't have a note you know yeah. and then also realizing the weight of you know the potential impact on his decision the the ripple impact and when someone takes their own life they they're not looking to hurt people usually they're looking to relieve their own pain right. 
And, um, and yet when they do that, what they don't realize is that they're multiplying their pain on to everyone who cares about them. Mm-hmm. And, and so there was that, you know, dad, you know, I'm glad, I, I'm glad you're in heaven now. Good for you. But now we've got to deal with this, you know? Yeah. And, um, so I get, I would say moments of anger more so than guilt, though. I know guilt is a strong one for people, you know? A lot of people feel guilty because they think, well, I should have seen that coming or Mm -hmm. I Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't see signs of it, but there isn't Mm -hmm. always signs. Is there Sherry? Mm -hmm. No, uh, we never could have imagined. And my dad was Mr. Safety. He was a retired deputy sheriff. Um, and, uh, I just, and, and, you know, as I mentioned the rock climbing and certain things that that he did throughout his life that were were risky, or you could say he was he was very safety and meticulous, um, safety conscious and, and meticulous. So this just seemed kind of you know reckless, and um, you know again the song "A Power of a Moment." You just can't take it back. Lord have mercy for the things we lack. Um, so. so so that is just, you know, it's one part of his, of his whole life, but now it's a part of my story. And I'm hoping that in sharing and talking, people feel less alone and uh, that through the music that's forthcoming, that, um, that God will, as he is faithful to do, God will redeem this hard part of my story um, and minister to others, um, you know, with gospel hope and that, you know, the hope we have in Christ. So um. that's awesome. And that, that's a huge part of it. Uh, I think things are easier now than they used to be, but people, there used to be such a stigma around this sort of thing and people didn't talk about it. And I think people really had no idea how often this impacts people's lives. And Mm -hmm. um, so I, I commend you for for speaking mm. out and wanting to minister to others and um, and being open, I know you've been open in your writings um, about your pain and and your grief, and it's kind of a unique position when you're used to being a minister and and then you're like just needing to be ministered to yourself, you know, and um, and you took that time, you took the time you needed to. Mm-hmm. To heal. Yes, and I remember during that time, Debbie, I've, I can count on one hand the times I have turned down an interview opportunity or a, a, a concert invitation, you know, or some kind of ministry event, whatever. And uh, during this time of this grief fog that I described, I was invited, you know, to minister at this whole Women's Day event in Georgia or wherever it was. And there's going to be multiple speakers and authors and such and uh have a broad reach and broad impact all of that and I just wrestled with it so much before the Lord but came to the conclusion you know I am not myself a whole woman how can I go (laughs) you know and minister was like Lord are you requiring this of me now and the answer was no but that was hard for me because um you know you you don't want to ever present as if the Lord isn't strong enough in your weakness to enable you and empower you to do whatever it is he called, he's called you to do, but he's also just a merciful God. And with that decision, I know I made the right decision. It was the decision to fight for my own health Mm -hmm. so that I could then in turn encourage others with the encouragement the Lord has given to me, you know, with the comfort the Lord has comforted me with. And, um, so that was an example of a time where, um, uh, I said no to the invitation mm-hmm. and there may be times for your viewers, you know, even, even over the holidays to use that as an example where it's okay to say no to the invitation. If the intent is, um, you know, you're looking for your, for more heart healing with, with your own grief or wound, you know? Right. Um, so to, it's hard to pour. Uh, it sounds like such a cliche, but it's hard <laughs> to pour out of an empty cup. You know, sometimes yeah. you have to just let 
our wounds heal enough so that we can, we're just not capable. I, I know there's been a few mm -hmm. times doing what I do. I deal with people's pain 24 seven. And there's been a few times where I've mm -hmm. just been dealing with so much myself. I just had to like step back a little bit because I, mm -hmm. my own pain was so overwhelming. I just yes. say, I, I have to, I have to get a little bit past this before I can deal with somebody else's at the moment. And that's okay. We have to, we have that freedom to say, I need this for me and, uh -huh. and God gives us that grace. And so we need to give that grace to ourselves, I think, uh -huh. and to others as well. Right. And you think about it, you know, you might say, well, as Christians, isn't that selfish, but think of how gracious we are with other people. Yeah. We're, we're, uh, we're not as gracious with ourselves as we are with other people. So, um, and, and everything is a season, you know, there's seasons of joy and there's seasons of sorrow and, um, there's seasons of planting and seasons of pulling up and see, you know, mm -hmm. so if it helps us to, uh, have a broader perspective of our lives and the great thing with us as believers is that, we can know that whatever season we're in, that God is for our good. Yeah. And, and he's writing a bigger story uh, than, than we can see. Um, let, me, let me see. This might, be, this might be relevant if I can find, uh, find the spot where this is. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is good. This isn't the thing I was aiming for, but this is good. I wrote, um, this was nine days before dad passed. Hmm. I wrote this verse in my journal. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, oh, death is your victory. Where, oh, death is your sting. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. <laughs> um, let me see if I can find this other thing. Yes. Isn't it the challenge um, for so many of us is to get over our own stories, you know, heal of our own brokenness with the Lord's help, so that we can help others, mm -hmm. you know, um, and God can bring fruit from, from our stories. I wrote this, um, and this sort of circles back, but, um, I think it's good. I wrote this in my journal. Um, uh, see, this would have been, you know, a few, this would have been maybe a month or so after dad passed, um, I said, today, I feel the anger that dad did what he did because I know I have music to share and that's what I should be doing, but I'm grief broke. Mm. The steps are simply too overwhelming for me. It's a can't do it thing. <laughs> it's funny the way I wrote that. Um, I don't know when I can get back to normal and soon it'll be a year since he died. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So this was more like a year after, sorry. It was September two, And I don't even need to write that because I'll never forget. Mm -hmm. And then flip to the next page. I'm skipping, skipping. Um, uh, talked about how he may have ended his own pain, but how it multiplied to the rest of us. And I said, I'm mad. And this is the irony. I'm mad at you because you couldn't see past yourself, your circumstance. And yet now in this moment, anyway, I can't see past mine. Mm. You get that? Yeah. And um, I, I thought, oh gosh, isn't that so interesting? And so Lord, like help us get past our own stories there. Help us feel through them, grieve through them. Um, you know, honor the weight of the impact of whatever our stories are. Yeah. properly look at that look at it acknowledge it it's true it happened it was horrible it was painful whatever it was but 
allow the Lord to heal and whatever that looks like for you, do that cooperative work with the Holy Spirit so that God can redeem all of those things. Right. And he, like only he can so that Satan doesn't get the victory for whatever that, you know, hard thing was, or that unfair thing was, or that unjust thing was, um, God is one who flips the story around. And now he will use, he will use this very thing. I know moving forward, um, to do a healing work in others, you know, as he's brought healing to me through sitting with him in the scriptures and, and praying and, and looking to him for the answers and hoping in his promises, all those things that we do. Yeah. So <laughs> you touched on something and, and I think um, it's important to, it, I, I can't encourage people enough to memorize scripture because it is a lifeline when we feel uh-huh. like we're drowning. Those things that you've ingrained in your heart, in your spirit, they come to mind. Uh-huh. And, um, and as you were reading what you wrote a few days before he passed, I do think God prepares us in little ways. Sometimes we're not, we're not aware of it at the time. You weren't uh-huh. aware that that's what he was, no. but you can go back and see that he was already speaking truth into your heart. Yes, I know. Isn't that is such a gift? Yes. Uh, God's word is so amazing. Um, and interestingly, just the other day um, from one of my little devotionals, I read something that was such a cool thought. Um, this, the author was pointing out that the Bible is the only book for which the author is always present when you read it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, um, and so it's just such a gift to us really, you know? And I mean, there's been seasons in my life where I just had nothing in me. I was so depleted of everything and just couldn't even maybe even read the scriptures or, you know, but sometimes I would just like open, open it up and just lay it on my chest, you know, Mm -hmm. open up the Bible and just go, Lord, you know, see my weakness, be my grace sufficient, you know? Um, But then, like you said, um, when we store the scriptures in our hearts, uh, God, the Holy Spirit will bring them right to the forefront when we need it, you know. Um, so I'm really, really grateful for his word that doesn't disappoint. No, it doesn't. <laughs> his promises are like a lifeline thrown to a, a drowning person. They just <laughs> give us the strength and help us keep pressing on when it would be so easy to just get lost in the pain. If we just call to mind those promises, that's why I encourage everyone to put sticky notes. I had them <laughs> on my fridge, on my bathroom mirror, on my car, just everywhere. So my mind was constantly focused on the word and it mm-hmm. just really helps to keep your mind where it needs to be so that you can heal, let God heal you. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You want to tell everybody about this project um, that's coming up? I think, I think I know your last album ministered to people that were hurting so much. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. what was the name of that album again? Uh, well, two uh, in 2012, I released "So I Can Tell," mm-hmm. which was really a lot of the songs that came sort of uh, post-divorce. So it was a lot of how I processed the healing through divorce. And then 2015 was an album called No Longer My Own, which was just, you know, kind of the next chapter um, and lots of more healing songs on that project. It seems that, again, like the Sturb, sort of my go to when I'm feeling the weight, the crushing weight of emotions um, that I will go. That's what inspires me to go to the piano and hash it out with the Lord. You know, mm-hmm. like it talks about working out our salvation in scripture. I feel like in some ways I'm working things out with the Lord and rehearsing the truths. Um, you know, this new album is called what I know to be true. And, um, when dad passed, I was planning, you know, planning his certain memorial service and trying to figure out certain elements of that. You know, I knew that dad would want the gospel shared and I knew um, 
certain scriptures I wanted to have read. And then it's, you know, mom, what's your favorite hymn? You know, selecting the music, certain things, putting a program together. And um, uh, the, the song that I shared, um, it's called It Hurts to Say Goodbye to You. Um, it's, it speaks to that. I'm losing my train of thought now. Oh yeah, the, where the album title comes from is from a lyric in that song and it's mm. um, who will light the candles, you know, in this service. Okay, you know, is it a family member? Who, who will light the candles, speak the words of hope? Who will read the scriptures? Remind me what I know to be true because it hurts to say goodbye to you. Mm. And so in times, um, in times of deep, deep sorrow, we need to be reminded C.S. Lewis said, we need not as much to be instructed, but, but to be reminded of the truths that we know that we build our lives on. And uh, we, you know, just had some beautiful scriptures and gospel presentation and hymns. And um, in the song, it says, you know, who will play the music, seeing how great thou art, uh, who will share the gospel for Christ can heal our hearts and pull us through Lord. Uh, cause it hurts to say goodbye to you, you know? <laughs> um, so it sounds maybe simple and cliche, but it really comes back to, will we anchor ourselves to the truth, the word of God, um, or not, <laughs> you know, <laughs> And, and sometimes we have no strength in us to do it. It's not a, a white knuckling of ourselves. It's a, it's a, I'm laying flat on my back or, or I'm prostrate on the ground and Lord, I'm trusting you to cover me because I've got nothing in this moment. Mm -hmm. I have no answers. There is nothing good in the world, but I believe by faith and I speak with my mouth that you are good and you are sovereign and you are going to make something of this mess you know, and he, um, those are, those are those real anchor moments, you know, that he, he meets us. There's a song on this new album also called false anchors and, um, and just, you know, re reciting the things, the other, the, the things, the more temporal things that we cling to for comfort and security, you know, it's uh, how much money in our bank accounts or, you know, you know, our whatever, it is mm -hmm. um and the lord is bringing us back to hebrews six nineteen. i have this hope as an anchor for my soul firm and secure and it's jesus and anymore as the world gets crazier and crazier it seems is jesus 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 you know he is like my plan a there's no plan b <laughs> <laughs> yes well we yeah. don't need one when we have him <laughs> right he is, he is like, you know, he's our everything. And so, you know, Lord, help us to help us to offer our lives, offer our stories for your use, for your purposes, for your kingdom cause, um, to take as many, to point as many and take as many to Christ uh, with us as we can, as it would be the father's heart that none should perish, but all should have everlasting life. And um, so well, there you go. Thanks. So get over it. <laughs> no, I am kidding. Take the time to tend to your soul and trust God in the midst of it, you know. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Um, well, it, um, I'll give this last thing to you. If there's anything that you would like to, anything else that you feel led to share and and then mm -hmm. I'd ask, would you want to pray for everybody um, to wrap sure. up too? Sure. Um, thank you. Gosh, I'm trying to think what a what a great invitation um, to um, for you to put out there. I'm trying to think if there. Ah. Uh, okay. This is good. Uh, I read this book called Grieving a Suicide by Albert Shu, and he said, grief that has done its work in us will help us experience God's grace more fully. Mm. And I would say that I have um, known that to be true. Um, 
he's just a gracious God. Yeah. And um, so maybe that sort of um, brings it brings it around. <laughs> mm -hmm. I say often that God's grace is sufficient and um, I'll just believe for your listeners and viewers who are hurting um, that his grace is sufficient for you um, in this season. And that's exactly what it is, is a season. And um, I can just pray right now, I guess, in closing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Debbie. <laughs> Lord, we thank you uh, that you're good, that you're sovereign, that as we talk about these things, griefs of many kinds, um, that you are faithful, that you are trustworthy, that you are one who redeems, um, that you are one who draws near to the brokenhearted. Uh, that you are one uh, that when we are weak, you can be strong and we can lean into that. Many times we feel like we don't have it in us. Um, but Lord, you take our little bit and you make it much because of not our efficiency, but because of your all sufficiency. We can lean and rest on your plan and provision for us. Uh, not only the provision of salvation, forgiveness of sins, but the promise of eternal life, uh, that this earth is not our final destination, um, but that you are preparing a place for us. And we can cling to the scriptures and re revelation that we know that heaven is a place where there'll be no more tears or sorrow or crying or mourning or pain. But you say, behold, I am making everything new. And Lord, we cling to that, that you um, will make everything that is crooked straight and everything that is wrong, you will write. And we are just grateful to be in that number. Lord, teach us everything we need to know in these seasons of sorrow um, so that we can be better equipped. Uh, to be able to en encourage that next person coming along behind us. Um, thank you that you are um, an ocean of grace and a flood of mercy. And we cling to that and we rest in that in Jesus name. Thank you that you are Emmanuel, God with us. We thank you that uh, we're not alone. Uh, this holiday season, we may be living, physically living alone or separated from family or grieving a lost loved one or an estranged relationship, whatever it is, financial hardship. And yet you um, see us, you are, as the scripture says, the God who sees and you are Emmanuel, God with us, you sit with us. And um and we thank you for your presence and your promise. And we worship you and adore you and lift you to the highest place in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sherry. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to um, include all of your contact information where people can connect with you. And is this correct? Uh, if people want to get your new album, you're uh, collecting donations for it and in an exchange for that they'll get an out uh, your CD when it comes out, is CD. that correct? Yes, so the, yes, there is a, a GoFundMe link where people, if people want the physical hard CD, um, you know, that's sort of an open thing. Um, God has provided for the recording of the album. Now is the part of uh, launching and marketing and, and getting it out there into the world where God can use it. So if someone wants to sow a seed and be a part of that work, they can. And that's all on my website, sherrykeggy.com. Mm -hmm. And um, you can follow me on Facebook and such as well. And perhaps we'll circle back when the record's all done and, yeah. uh, and you know, I can share a song or something to that effect. <laughs> oh, that would and, be wonderful, yeah. Yeah, and you know what's neat about this record is uh, it is, yes, it is a lot of me processing the death of my dad as we've talked, but 
it is also the joy of be, being married again. There's a song on there that's called Restoration Song that my husband and I actually sang together, though he's not as he's not really a singer, he's a carpenter. But we felt led to sing it together at our wedding. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a song on there um, as I'm in a new role as a grandmother, a song I wrote to my expecting daughter as she was um, carrying um, my first grandson. And so a song for uh, new mothers, various encouragements, you know, that way. So it's not a total downer. <laughs> <laughs> no, even when you're talking about heavy things, they're still uplifting and encouraging. So that's, at least I've always known that from you. So I doubt that that's changed. So <laughs> very good. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Sherry, for being willing to come and, and share your heart and help others. I appreciate you, you and I love you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and I appreciate and love you too. And um, we'll stay in touch. Okay. Sounds good. Thank right. you everybody for tuning in. <laughs> God bless you. Bless you.